So I was talking about Big Bang nucleosynthesis and how that's uh, one of the supporting things for the Big Bang model. That it explains one of the things that were um, a curious um, fact that couldn't be explained before this alpha, beta, gamma paper that um, put out a theory that that's based on the Big Bang idea that the universe was much hotter in its earlier stage and um, and from yeah, much hotter in the earlier stage. And there were, um, there were times when the condition of the uni entire universe was right to form some of the lightest elements, helium, uh, hydro well, hydrogens, that's your starting point, and helium. Um, and and um, so that's a question that's uh, answered within the Big Bang model. Now there's a question that's not fully answered, but um, that uh, that where people think the answer to the question isn't too far away, and um, and and that uh, uh, that was uh, the uh, connected to the topic of my research when I was in graduate school. Um, I was. Um, um, the, or, I, or my advisor was a part of a collaboration called NEDM collaboration. And they were looking for something called electric dipole moment of a neutron. And the significance of that research, just to briefly uh, describe, is that it could describe creation of matter in the early universe. So when I showed this figure earlier, I was saying how, commenting how this figure in particular isn't really explaining anything. Um, this is what I mean. Um, so, so in the universe that exists today, we have an imbalance of electrons and positrons. By imbalance, I mean, we have more electrons than positrons. We have more matter than antimatter. Um, and and that's a, a really curious situation because um, according to the laws of physics, um, these are kind of indistinguishable as in they are flipped in terms of charge, but everything else is kind of symmetric. So if it's symmetric, why don't we have an equal amount of electrons and positrons and um, easy kind of flippant answer to that would be to say, oh, the universe just uh, started out with more electrons than positrons. Um, so you could answer that, but that's uh, almost uh, as useful in terms, in the context of science as saying, oh, we have more electrons than positrons because of magic. It's the way it is just because it is. <laughs> and, you know, that, that could totally be true, but, <laughs> If that were true, it would just bother, um, it should bother all the physicists in the world. It kind of ties back to something that uh, we refer to as the cosmological principle. And um, we, you know, you know, um, we raise this to the, um, the import, something that we call principle, because it's uh, something that we've seen called for a, across many different areas that um, that that there is an we want to be able to say that there isn't something very special about any very particular thing we see. Uh, we want to be able to say there isn't anything really special about Earth other than that we live on it, that there isn't anything special about the sun. There isn't anything special about Milky Way galaxy. I mean, you know, everything is unique like a snowflake, but it's unique like uh, by random chance. It's, uh, um, that's what we want to say. And the uh, cosmological principle says the universe is about the same everywhere as in any one particular part of universe. It's not any specially different. And what we would really like to be able to say is to extend that to everything. You know, there isn't really anything special about our universe. There isn't anything special about the initial starting conditions of the universe. So if we say that we have an imbalance of matter and antimatter 
because that's just how things are. That's kind of a violation of that principle because um, we would have to say there is something special about the amount of a starting matter, starting imbalance between the matter and antimatter in our universe. And that imbalance was just enough to create the stars and the galaxies we see. And, um, and we feel, uh, or I think a, a physicist should feel that's a very unsatisfying answer. And so a cosmologist, um, bias or initial inclination is to say the universe started out with a zero imbalance as in universe started with the same amount of matter and antimatter. So the process like this gamma ray turning into electron and positron, electron and positron turning into gamma rays. That's the process that was happening all the time at the beginning of the universe. And when you add up Electrons and positrons you see in the very early universe, they add up to all zero, you know, plus one electron. And whenever you have a positron count, there's minus one electron, and you add it all up, they add up to zero. So the problem here is that if we are starting out with a universe like that, where there's an equal amount of matter and antimatter, why should there now be an imbalance? Because the universe we live in now, uh, very clearly from the astronomical observations we see, don't have any significant amount of antimatter. If there were, we would kind of see the telltale signs where the antimatter is. We would see this kind of annihilation. We would see gamma rays coming off all the time from the region of universe that has antimatter in it. And we don't see it. So the universe we are in now has clearly an, uh, more matter than antimatter. So. So answering that is the kind of uh, question that, uh, frankly, I think it's amazing that we are in a place to actually ask and attempt to, to answer the question. It's a, the question of why do matter exist? It's the kind of question that Greek philosophers didn't even contemplate. It's like they would say, what do you mean why? They exist because they exist. Um, but now we can ask that question. And just so that I can give you the a search phrase you can use, the kind of um, theories that we have, it's called leptogenesis. Leptogenesis will cover creation of electrons uh, out of a universe that uh, did, well, I'm not talking about Jewish religious work, <laughs> creation, of, um, creation of electrons out of a universe that had, uh, didn't have an asymmetry between electrons and positrons. And uh, there's a counterpart for the protons and antiprotons, and that would be called uh, baryogenesis. And the and the the research I was doing connects here um, because if they find uh, electric dipole moment of neutron, that would help. Uh, fit into a piece of the puzzle that is required to explain baryogenesis. So, so this is still an active area of research. Um, it's all the, there are plenty of missing pieces here. So I don't wanna um, say that we know everything. Um, I think the things that I would point out is something called the Sakharov conditions. Uh, yeah, so, um, so and um, so this this is the set of conditions that uh, someone uh, proposed that if they existed, that would be sufficient to, to explain uh, uh, baryogenesis. And uh, this is uh, something that's not in our current uh, standard model of particle physics. Um, to have this, you need something called the grand unified theory, which people are still working on. We'll know whenever. <laughs> People are still working on this. Uh, uh, the phrase grand unified theory comes from something that Einstein said. So people have been working on it for, it's going to be 100 years pretty soon. <laughs> Anyways, there's that. Uh, this part is what connects to the electric dipole moment of um, neutrons. So um, CP symmetry violation is something that's important. It, it, uh, actually, we have, uh, we know of a significant uh, something called the charge conjugation and a charge conjugation and parity symmetry violation in particle physics. This is something that's already been detected. Now the challenge here is that amount of CP asymmetry that exists in our current theory is not enough. 
uh, it's uh, too small to explain the amount of matter in our current universe. So particle physicists and nuclear scientists are looking for sources of CP asymmetry all the time um, because we need more of it to actually explain the amount of matter in the uni universe. And that's where the, um, the electric dipole moment searches uh, connect. The indirect CP violation would be one of those. Uh, it might not be linked. Uh, let's see. Electric, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, strong CP problem. And um, so no one has uh, so far detected electric dipole moment of, of fundamental particles like electrons and neutrons. But when they do, that'll, um, that'll help answer this problem. Um, and uh, and the, the third condition is actually what connects to uh, what we've been talking about in, uh, in this class, cosmology. This uh, interaction out of thermal equilibrium, it is actually one piece of the Sakharov condition that we think we have. Uh, the Big Bang cosmology actually provides for this interaction out of thermal equilibrium. Um, interaction must be out of thermal equilibrium. Where is it? Um, in the, well, I, I guess they don't quite say it, but in, in the, um, in our current, the you know standard model Big Bang cosmology, um, there's a whole. Uh, so where I guess the universe for a long time people thought we might be in this universe, and I guess we are gonna be in this universe. In any case, um, in this model of expansion of universe, there were moments in time when interaction would have happened uh, out of thermal equilibrium. In fact. Um, one of the ways that's uh, one of the things that's necessary for Big Bang uh, cosmology to be right is uh, there's a something called inflation that's I think in a different section uh, inflationary universe and um, this uh, uh, this inflation era would be a time when things interaction could happen out of equilibrium and the expanding universe you know actually i don't know it might even be within this uh, some of the these parts there's a uh, places where different particles decouple uh, in the interaction so the big bang cosmology is what provides that third condition uh, interaction out of a thermal equilibrium and we think that there were uh, times in the early universe when that could have happened. So this is kind of, um, you know, fun, uh, snap uh, cross section of fundamental research. And it um, um, it's a kind of, I think I was saying this uh, yesterday um, when I was being recorded that a lot of this fundamental science research, the biggest organization that funds it is government, the people, uh, the general public through taxpayer, uh, through their taxes, through the government. Um, and uh, it, uh, I think it's worthwhile pursuit. It's a kind of a culture and a lot of philosophies about answering questions, deep questions like where do we come from? And answering the grand unified theory, baryogenesis would be <laughs> one of the outcomes of explaining where we, where the things that they make up us and our sun comes from. And um, and you know, I, no one expects there's any profit to be made out of research like this, which is why, uh, which is why the people have to fund it out of the generosity of their heart, um, and. And uh, yeah, that's uh, um, a lot of things in science are connected. And uh, it, I, as I was saying before, my primary training isn't in astronomy. It's not even in astrophysics or cosmology, but, um, but <laughs> because I was in fundamental physics research, uh, some of the things that I was working on to in some very uh, indirect way connected to <laughs> things that have something to do with astronomy. Um, so I think that's uh, long enough of my monologue. I am kind of out of time, 703. So let me, I, I guess I never got to this point, um, which is fine. You know, if you know where to find the Stellarium. You can look around yourself. 
And yeah, I, I think I've demonstrated it enough in an earlier session, so I don't think I need to 